Hi everyone, I hope everyone is okay. Um, in this video, I'm looking at symbolism in Henrik Ibsen's play A Doll's House from 1875. Um, this video is predominantly aimed at students that are studying the play as part of their A-level, for example, the political and social protest writing module with AQA, but it might also be useful if you're studying the play for drama, whether that be for GCSE or even um, at other levels, such as undergraduate. So um, you should be able to get something from this play because essentially we all study the same play, regardless of um, the level or the qualification we're studying. So to keep things simple, I'm going to be going through a selection of key symbols or motifs that we see in this play and then just explain very clearly um, why those um, symbols could help us interpret the characters, the themes, and the significant meanings that Ibsen is creating in this drama text. So the first symbol or motif that I want to talk about is doors. And if you read the opening of the uh, Act 1 in the stage directions, repeated reference to doors. And of course, as this is eff effectively the curtain going up, the reader, if you're reading the play, needs to be told the the, what the home looks like, otherwise we don't quite know. So yes, it does help us understand the layout of the home and how this room where the play takes place is kind of in the heart of the home with other rooms going off of it, such as the hall and how the study and so on. However, there's a, there's a more deeper meaning to this other than just the layout of the home, because doors, of course, keep people out and they also keep people in. Doors can be locked and those uh, that have the power to unlock the door have the keys and usually the people that have keys are the people that have the most power. If you think of a school caretaker for example there's a reason why all the students don't have keys to all the classrooms. It's because they have less power than the teachers or the caretaker. Um, and obviously in this play we are quite used to hearing or seeing other characters entering or exiting the lounge or the front room. Um, but not Nora. So when Nora finally leaves that house, she obviously has to exit through a door, which is something that she hasn't really done a lot of in this play. And that makes her exit even more significant because she finally breaks th free from that home um, and the um, kind of unpleasantness that that home represents for her by exiting, which is something we haven't really seen her do very much at all. She's almost been like a trapped animal and she has to bear other characters coming in the room, like Krogstad, for example. Um, and hypothetically, if I was to show you a picture of your own front door, of your own home, chances are most people would associate that door with safety or privacy or comfort because it's where they feel safe, their home. However, that's not the case for everyone. And for some people, if I was to show them a picture of their front door, they would actually panic because something perhaps has happened in that home which they don't like or which they dread. So we've always got this question. We don't we never quite know what's happening behind closed doors. What is happening behind closed doors? We don't know because obviously the door um, shields us from the reality of the inside of the home. So doors are significant. They keep people in, but they also keep people out. It's a form of control. Thinking again about the idea of kind of what happens behind closed doors, the second symbol in this play is the house itself. Of course, this is significant because it's what the title of the play is. The house is middle class. It's comfortably but not luxuriously furnished. Um, and one of the things that I always get students to think about is the difference between a house and a home. A house is a building, bricks and mortar. But a home is what you make it through bringing your own identity and your own personality into that space to make it a place of comfort and sanctuary. Um, however, in this play, of course, from Nora's perspective, this is a, a home which has oppression and claustrophobia in it um, because it's that house which is synonymous with Nora's own sense of dystopia. In other words, that house is a cage for her. And that's why when you see posters advertising this um, play, if it's being performed, they will often choose the motif of the bird in the cage uh, to represent that symbolically. Um, and if you think of a doll's house, many of you might have had a doll's house as a children. You might still have them because I think they're quite collectible. 
Um, a doll's house is a toy, essentially, and the front of that doll's house opens like a cover. And it's only by peering inside you see the reality of the situation. So the house might look lavish and luxurious on the, uh, on the front, but that doesn't mean that um, things inside are the same. And in this case, we obviously have a middle class home where the Halmers live, which looks pretty idealistic um, or sentimental, in fact. Um, but that doesn't mean their marriage is of good quality. And as the play progresses, of course, their marriage begins to disintegrate. Um, so in this play, there's a rejection of idealism and sentimentality in favour of promoting something that's real, presenting something that's real. And that's why, in part, the play was so controversial, because um, this isn't just one house that we're talking about here. It could be, you know, one of many homes across the country or society. So the house is itself um, significant. In this play, we're peering inside that home and uh, seeing the reality. Um, one of the things that we are told in Act One is that uh, Nora is eating macaroons, which is a circular, circular kind of sweet, quite brightly coloured. You can buy them in supermarkets, in fact. And one of the things that Halma has told Nora is that she should not eat these sweets because it will ruin her teeth or something like that. And this is, of course, showing a clear power imbalance. Uh, usually it's parents that prohibit their children from eating sweets. Sometimes, you know, parents will say to children, you can only have three sweets after dinner or something. Um, but we're talking here about a grown up woman and her husband, not a parent and child. So again, the dynamic is, in, of, is, is of imbalance here. She then invites Mrs. Lind and Dr. Rank to have a macaroon as well, as if she wants to have some influence over her friends in this room and uh, kind of um, share in that sense of rebellion. So the fact that she's hiding those macaroons in her pockets and eating them in the first place, you know, carefully wiping her mouth, um, suggests that she is somebody that is capable of rebellion and secrecy. Uh, unlike uh, this kind of childlike persona that she puts on in the beginning when she speaks to Halma, she actually is capable of complexity, more complexity, in fact, than we initially thought. And of course, this complexity and this um, ability to rebel and keep secrets foreshadows her later exit at the end of the play. So macaroons are also important. Another form of rebellion that we see from, uh, from um, Nora is through the silk stockings in Act 2. She shows Dr. Rank her silk stockings. And this is a form of sexual rebellion because we get the impression that there is a degree of chemistry between these two characters. Um, at the time, uh, it would it would have been scandalous to show another man other than your husband the stockings above the ankle. And she's showing uh, Dr. Rank the whole uh, lower leg, effectively. So clearly this is, again, a form of sexual rebellion. And just like with the macaroons, it shows her ability to break rules and social codes, uh, particularly those expected of women and married mothers. And it foreshadows, again, her later decision to leave the house, uh, again, showing this is a woman who is capable of making her own decisions. Um, the next symbol is the Christmas tree. Um, and Christmas is also known um, as the festival of the home. And obviously we don't hear that very much anymore. It's kind of lost that label. Um, but this is significant, of course, because this is a play essentially about a home at Christmas. Christmas, we think of togetherness and festivities and family time. And that, I think, makes even more shocking what Nora does in terms of leaving at the end, because even Christmas and that sense of togetherness is not enough to keep her in the home. Um, a Christmas tree, of course, is something that we decorate to make it look better than it actually is. None of us like to have a plain green tree in our front room. So a Christmas tree is something that is dressed up to make it look better than it actually is. It's a form of decoration. And as the play progresses, we get told that that Christmas tree, because it's a real tree, begins to become dishevelled. Um, and it starts to represent metaphorically the decaying state of the marriage between Halma and Nora. Um, and this idea of breaking away from artifice, uh, no matter how lavishly you decorate a tree, it's always going to die eventually, particularly if it's real. And of course, even if you have a plastic tree, you're going to have to take that tree down in January. So it only looks good for so long. Um, so this idea of dressing something up 
to make it look better is clearly a metaphor for the way Halma treats Nora, because when you get to the Tarantella uh, dress and dance, again, this is something that she wears to please Halma for the party at the beginning of Act Three. Um, Halma chooses this dress for her to wear, um, and when they get back home after the party in Act Three, and Halma's had a bit to drink, um, he says things like, you know, isn't she lovely? Um, look at my lovely wife or something like that. So she, he almost objectifies her um, as if he wants her to be looked at and marvelled in the same way that you would dress a dollop. Of course, you dress a dollop as well. So the Christmas tree and Nora have this kind of synonymous relationship with this idea of dressing something up to make it look better. And of course, what happens is um, she, when uh, she changes in Act 3 after um, Halma's outburst, she wears much more regular uh, kind of uh, duller clothes, showing that she's made a transition from that doll wife idea in the Tarantella costume to more of an individual. The, um, the bloom is off the rose. She is now real and her clothing represents that transition. The dress, of course, gives an impression of a facade of happiness. She's giving the impression in that Tarantella ball that she's happy, which is, of course, far from what she's feeling inside. She's been plagued by feelings of suicide as we've gone on through the play. She's she's talked about that with Krogstad a lot. Uh, she feels that in some respects there's a sense of an ending here because she knows that that letter is in the letterbox by this point. So just because she's wearing this dress and dancing and giving the impression that she's in a state of celebration for New Year doesn't actually mean she feels happy because she doesn't deep down. Um, and one of the things that Halma also gives Nora to do is a dance routine. And the dance routine, of course, has rules which you follow, uh, which Nora uh, allegedly forgets when she's practising this dance at the end of Act Two with Dr. Rank playing the piano. And during this dance, her hair falls down and she begins to dance in a much more freestyle kind of way. Uh, and again, showing that break away from Halma's repressive expectations. She probably has not forgotten the dance moves, but she's deliberately breaking away and going more freestyle to show a degree of individuality. So the dance and the dress is also synonymous with this idea of dressing something up. The next symbol is Krogstad's letter, and this letter is representative of truth. Um, and it is the catalyst by which Nora um, leaves the home because it allows her to see Halma and imagine what it really is, because it's reading this letter that makes Halma react the way he does, which is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Of course, Nora wanted Halma to kind of say they're going to get through this together as a, as a couple, but all Halma is worried about is his own reputation and what it means for his own respectability. Um, and that's, you know, that's the nail in the coffin for Nora. Um, so it shows the letter is also representative of truth, but it's also representative of masculine respectability in this society. It was incredibly important for Halma to feel respectable as a former lawyer, but now as a bank manager who has the power to hire and fire people, uh, including Krogstad, for example. Uh, it's also representative of, of Krogstad's blackmail, of course, as well. So you could ask, you could argue, you know, to what extent should Nora be thankful for this letter? Um, because maybe without Krostad, she would have married Halma for the rest of her life, which would have been a wasted life, um, shouted in this home. Perhaps she uh, has to thank Krostad and Mrs Lind um, for allowing this letter to be read by Halma, because it's that that brings about something better when she leaves the home. So the letter is also significant. Money is a central theme in this play, and of course, money is central to respectability and status. Uh, the character's lack of money, their need for money, and their desire to get more money motivate much of the play's action. Uh, so for, if you think of Crossdad, for example, um, he has loaned Nora, in our money, about £250, not a lot of money, in fact, and that gives him the ability to blackmail her. Um, as he says, you know, if I get thrown into the gutter, I'm bringing you with me. So Crossdad's relationship with money enables him to become the antagonist. Um, of course, it's worth remembering why Nora did take this loan out. She took this loan out because she had to save her husband's life, because it was believed that taking your uh, ill 
um, relative to a warmer climate, such as Italy, uh, improved the health. And that's what she did. So Nora took the initiative. She found a loan shark and forged her father's signature, although she got the date mixed up, unfortunately. Um, she she dated the contract or the IOU after her father died on the 29th of September. So she she made a mistake there. And that's what brings about Krogstad's suspicion. But she did use initiative, of course, and she did, in fact, save her husband's life, something which he seems to be completely oblivious to in his anger in Act 3. So you could argue that she sacrificed herself for her husband, which women were told they should do at the time. You know, as a good, dutiful wife, if your duties are to your husband and children, why would you not do this? So she becomes a criminal as a result of saving her husband's life. And this is why she cannot win. She either breaks the law and gets the loan out or she suffers her husband's loss and is labelled a bad wife. She can't win. So this is a masculine world of finance and power. And of course, Nora is not a man, um, but she tries to gain some, uh, I suppose, masculine traits in terms of money and finance with her ability to make repayments. She kind of shows off with Mrs. Lind and thinks, she, you know, she knows everything about quarterly interest. Um, she kind of works in secret to make money. She does some copying work in the attic to make those instalments. And we believe that she's made those instalments dutifully and regularly, which is good. She hasn't fallen behind. Um, and she says at the end, uh, sorry, she says at the beginning with Mrs. Lind, it was almost like being a man, she says, having this kind of financial freedom. So you could say that this money idea gives her the taste of freedom and enables her to reject the constraints of womanhood which then enables her to leave at the end. So everything is kind of geared again towards this idea of leaving at the end following um, Halmer's outburst. Goals, uh, of course, are important. It's in the title. Nora says herself, I have been your doll wife just as at home I was Papa's doll child and here the children have been my dolls. So this idea of cross-generational um, oppression, really, this idea of being a doll, not necessarily a doll like a Barbie doll, but think of a puppet or a marionette, uh, a doll which is worked with strings. Um, this idea of being worked by something more powerful than you. So this idea of compliance, voicelessness, something that's dressed up without independence or freedom and also confined to the home. If you have a doll's house, your dolls are likely to stay in that home, which is exactly what's happened with Nora. And they've been married for eight years and they've got three children. And for all intents and purposes, they seem to be a happy middle class family. However, that's not the case. His selfish reaction to reading the letter in Act 3 makes her see her marriage for what it really is and, and what the home for what it really is. And she realises that it's all a facade and she has lost her own sense of identity by being in this position. Finally, uh, the final symbol, and there might be others, but for this PowerPoint, I'm just looking at, at these. Finally, the tenth symbol is birds. Um, the cage bird motif, of course, is a common motif to do with oppression and flightlessness, that idea of being trapped. Um, in the beginning, Halmut labels Nora with a list of birds. Um, they are possessive. He often says my. And the zoomorphisms uh, dehumanise Nora um, so Halmer can fulfil his sense of superiority. It gives him power to call his wife a little sparrow or a little thrush, for example. And of course, those animals are cute, beautiful and delicate. So there's also a degree here of gender stereotypes and the male gaze, how men want to view their wives as being less powerful than they are. She also allows it in that beginning, or at least she seems to. She almost labels herself these same terms, suggesting a degree of complicity. Um, she's complicit in this labelling of herself, even though this might be an act. Um, the bird, though, can also be a symbol of hope. Emily Dickinson, for example, wrote a poem in which she said hope is a thing with feathers. And in the end, of course, Nora becomes a bird, metaphorically, who stretches her wings and flies away out of that home. So finally, she unlocks that door of the cage and she does set herself free uh, democratically in order to seek self-determination and self-governance. So she emancipates herself from that cage of the home. 
Um, so birds are also something which are um, important as well. So if you were to mention any of these symbols for a doll's house, uh, you would be talking about meanings, um, dramatic methods, how the language uh, enables us as an audience to interpret the significant characterization or themes of the play. So hopefully that was useful if you are studying Henrik Ibsen's A Doll's House. Thank you.